only time Edith was ever late for her job was the day the 8 o'clock express train derailed just before entering the Philandia Tunnel. As soon as she heard the screaming metal, she began to think about her will. In a vulnerable moment, she written everything over to her German shepherd, Max. Her two sons would be extremely jealous. And who knew they might... Frank wore glasses and a red tie to work every day. And the day he won the lottery was no different. Even on his last day of being middle class, Frank was diligent to his accounting. He stopped staring out the window of the train and opened up his briefcase to prepare himself for the day's clients. He worked as an accountant with the firm Murray and Markovitz. But being neither Murray nor Markovitz, he was not assigned to the town's interesting clients, the heavily corrupt and painfully indebted. Frank struggled hard not to fall asleep listening to his clients' description of their businesses buying and selling legitimate products to living people. They needed an accountant not to hide their tracks or bury a body, but simply to tally up the columns in their honesty so books. For blood pressure reasons known only to her doctor and herself, Judy could not lower her left arm. To onlookers, she was a person perpetually hailing the cab of life. For the most part, the town had gotten used to her condition. If someone stopped and stared, or offered Judy a stack of bibles, it was clear to all that they were the outsider, not Judy. So trips to town on the railroad became as routine to Judy as to those with their arms by their sides. It was when Judy ventured near the forest behind her house that she was most aware of her raised arm, tree-like and vulnerable. It was great because I saw as I did the business that the, the more... I gave people a description of the characters. I mean, if, you, if you see the packaging that they have in stores now for these things, it's a blister pack with four or five characters, and that's it. But I decided I wanted to give the people a little more, a little more incentive to, to buy the figures. So I started putting little descriptions in. And people used to write me, and they'd email me back saying, oh, you know, it's so much easier and more fun to pick your figurines because you're telling us what they're all about. So I got a few of those emails, and over time, kind of evolved into my head and I said, gee, you know, maybe I'll give them something more. So that's when I started getting into the idea of writing little booklets, little booklets like this one, this size. And I'd start telling about the figurines and the wildest day they ever had in their little miniature lives.
a drive-in movie theater. And I'd love to say that it was my idea, but it wasn't. This guy said, I want a drive-in movie theater, but I want you to use an iPod for the theater screen and hook it up to the internet so it'll play off YouTube or MySpace or whatever the internet uh, videos that are up there. something called Tiny Tuesday. It's a really fascinating article. The author's into human miniaturization. I've been reading a lot about that lately. The author is concerned that there are too many resources we're using up that are not renewable. And the only way to extend their use is for us to use less. And making people smaller certainly will make resources stretch further. Just think, if you turn this whole area into a miniaturized metropolitan area, and the uh, factories down here in Brooklyn, over in Greenpoint, where you live, those factories that pollute so much over there, the smoke coming out of them would be like nothing. It would be like a couple of doctors having a cigarette break out in front of a hospital.